Hi, everybody. This is Donna from Yoga in My School, and this is the Yoga in My School podcast. I'm so glad that you decided to join us today for a listen or for a look here on the video version. Um, we are starting off 2020 today, and uh, it is our first uh, episode of the new decade. And uh, a couple of months ago, uh, a good friend of mine, Kim McNeil, uh, she put on her, her uh, pot on her blog uh, a really interesting concept that got me thinking. It was at the end of November, kind of as we were getting geared up to the holiday season. And uh, she talked about experiencing versus acquiring. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. But for everybody who's listening and watching, I really would appreciate it if you could, if you're interested in this topic, if you're interested in anything else that we're sharing here on the Yoga in My School podcast, where we delve into all things yoga lifestyle, kids yoga, youth yoga, just, you know, learning to live a really connected life. And um, so if you're interested in those type of things, please share this podcast. Um, give us some stars on whatever version you're watching and write a review, that kind of stuff. It really helps for others to find the podcast. And I find that I talk a lot about podcasts that have intrigued me and have interesting con uh, concepts and guests. And so I, I'm sure that today with Kim, this will be one that you will find lovely. All right. Without further ado, uh, Kim McNeil. How you doing, Kim? I'm well, Donna. How are you? I'm good. So Kim and I go back a number of years now. She's from Calgary. I'm from Edmonton area. Um, we connected, oh, I don't, I can't remember if it was maybe about arthritis and yoga. I think it, I think it probably was. Yeah. Right? That's and mostly some, how I connect with people <laughs> some way, shape or form. Yeah. Right. But you're a yoga therapist, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you do a lot of work with, um, uh, chronic illnesses and um, arthritis, cancer, chronic pain, all that kind of stuff. So can you tell people a little bit about your background, what's brought you to this point, and any, you know, pivotal moments in your mm -hmm. life that have, you know, brought you to 2020? Yeah, I, I, as you said, I'm a certified yoga therapist under the uh, International Association of Yoga Therapy, or yoga therapists, and that is, um, you know, a collective of people from the healthcare profession world, and then also the yoga world, that have uh, an interest and also an expertise in working with people, as you said, with various chronic conditions, everything from disease to pain to um, other sorts of conditions that would require them to have specialty classes and uh, and to work with someone that has a um, you know a, an expertise in those areas above and beyond just the generic i would say yoga class that you you attend at a studio so that um, that came about because i had i just i had students that i had been working with for a long time and they came to me you know and sometimes it would be a whisper right saying kim i can't I can't do this pose because I have arthritis in my wrists, but it's not because I don't want to take part. And that's how it started. And, uh, and, and then that grew, right? And then I realized, oh yeah, I'm going to have to take it up a notch in terms of what I can offer and what I know, what I need to learn to be able to serve this community. And then, and then that branched out into everything from yoga for cancer, which is a big uh, a big part of what I've done in the past, not so much anymore, but it's it's still part of that, uh, unfortunately. Um, but we have a great community in Calgary based on the Yoga Thrive um, program, research program at the U of C. So that came about as well. And then also mental health has played a huge part in, in what I do. And that's in a way, a sp it sprinkles over everything else because when you have chronic pain, when you have arthritis, when you're diagnosed with a, with a chronic condition, it it changes your self-perception. It changes how you how you see yourself, and oftentimes that that comes along with um, with mental health issues. So that's a little bit about me. And then through that, I've I started writing. So sort of like what you're doing with your podcast, which I think is incredible. It's so awesome that you're you're putting this out there. I I write. I write a lot, and and I find as more time goes on, <laughs> the more I write, and the less I teach in more of a formal way. Um, as well, and that's a whole other side to the story. But I, I came across this um, this article in Forbes, and it was about um, a Cornell University 
professor researcher in the uh, department of psychology, Dr. Gilovich, and he wrote about this concept of experiences versus acquisitions, I guess if you could say, or, or doing versus having. And it, um, it resonated with me. And I went through a rabbit hole, down a rabbit hole of his work. And uh, it's, it's fascinating. So just as a, a quick little you know, thing right at the beginning, I recommend anyone to, to search out his work because he has some great perspectives on, on, uh, on this topic, I guess. And he, of course, he branches out a lot um, in his research, but it's, it's fantastic. All right. Now, in your blog post, you wrote um, about a particular event, uh, a, a cycling event. <laughs> can, you, can you tell us a little bit about that cycling event and kind of how your reflections on that and how it ties in? Mm hmm. So I'm a road cyclist, a little bit more about, about me, and I've been a road cyclist since, wow, I, this is the ninth year, I guess, that I, that I have been doing that in, um, you know, in a number of various capacities growing in terms of how much I ride every year and uh, you know, do it for fundraising events as well. It's, it's a huge part of my life. Uh, and that, that was precipitated by a brief stint, a few years as a mountain biker, which I also recommend because when you mountain bike, you learn how to deal with all sorts of things like, um, you know, random things on the road that you have to ride around or over or whatever the case may be. So you develop this skill set. And um, in a way, they both have different sort of uh, challenges, right? One is I might hit a tree <laughs> going down, <laughs> down, a, down a trail. And then the other one is you, you have traffic to contend with and and those sorts of things on the on the road, which in some ways is way more dangerous. Uh, I'd rather you know contend with the bear on the trail than I would um, a high speed you know vehicle. But anyways, having said that, I um, I've moved into road cycling. I haven't done a lot of mountain biking in in the last few years, and um, so when I do it, it's like starting almost from scratch. And I had uh, been visiting. Vancouver, the West Coast, and I, I went to Squamish for um, a few days at the beginning of September, and I, I rented a mountain bike and went with a friend. And if you know anything about Squamish, it's, it's an area of Canada that's renowned for its mountain biking. So when you, you know, and then you have to adjust like your expectations of what a green run would be, and then what a, you know, what a blue run would be, because <laughs> a blue run in Squamish is not like a blue run, say, perhaps in Edmonton, right? Or even in Calgary proper, they're not, it's not the same. So anyways, so we went, um, we, we took this one trail. And uh, so I'm, I'm almost starting from scratch and I'm, you know, I'm trying to get my bearings and I'm with someone who's really confident and I'm great fitness, so that's fine. But then you start the descent, right? And you start the descent on a trail that is way, way above your uh, confidence level and your ability and it's you know throwing all these things at you you know gravel and these really tight switchbacks and banks and you know bridges that are really way too narrow for your for your mind to comprehend and um i had a little bit of a moment yeah i have uh, speaking of mental health i can suffer from anxiety sometimes so i had an anxiety attack on the side of the trail and i'm like i can't do this this is you know at the very least embarrassing you know and there's people that are like half my age going by, <laughs> like it's nothing. And, um, and of course it doesn't make any sense, right? Because I haven't written a lot. So what am I expecting? But of course you're a perfectionist sometimes or we can be. And so it wasn't really good. And then eventually I, I literally got back on my bike or on my horse, as they say, and, uh, and I kept going and made it to a part of the trail that, um, was adjusted and was a little bit easier. And then by that point, it seemed like a cakewalk. And, um, and so I went through all these highs and lows in such a, a brief period of time. And I, I ended up loving it. I, I just, you know, the, the adrenaline rush that you get and the confidence boost and being outside and doing something that I hadn't done before was fantastic, but it was ugly there for, <laughs> It was really ugly. You know, you don't, you don't put that on Instagram, right? You don't put that on <laughs> the, the, uh, 
the breakdown on the side of the trail. You don't always talk about that part, but so you post the beautiful picture of you, you know, navigating yeah. the trail like a champ. Yeah, the finish line. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's yeah. like I, it's true. I, here's the finish line. <laughs> In between the beginning and the finish line may not have been really pretty, but I, no. I did this, and that's uh, I think that's really the point is that you, you, you know that you had the challenge and that increased your adrenaline rush, your awareness of the moment that it wasn't easy for you and, and that it meant so much more in the end because you had to fight through <laughs> this, this emotional, mental work um, of actually, no, I can do this. I'm going to do this. Damn it. And we'll be gone. The embarrassment, the, the pride, like put it all aside and just let's get this done. And, um, I love that you were willing to share that, um, that vulnerability in your blog post and that it, you know, it just ties in so well with all of this stuff that we're going to be talking about today. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. In your post, you start with one of um, Dr. Gilevich's quotes, and you, it says, hang on, I've got it written down here. Our experiences are a bigger part of ourselves than our material goods. You can really like your material stuff. You can even think that part of your identity is connected to those things, but nonetheless, they remain separate from you. In contrast, your experience really are part of you. We are the sum total of our experiences. So how can we, or maybe how have you been able to separate your experiences from your stuff? Mm, that's a good question. Well, I, I'll start by saying that um, I remember now I didn't rent the bike. It was, it was given to me, right? It was lent to me that day. And uh, I feel like the bike and I are like this now. We're, we're buddy, buddy. But at the same time, I don't remember the type of bike I used. I know it was a mountain bike and I know that it had, you know, it was a hardtail, so it had certain shocks and everything else. I don't remember the brand. I might be able to guess at the color. I have a picture to go by, um, but that's not the thing that I remember from it, right? Even though I was grateful that it did its job because um, you need a good bike, right? But, um, but what I remember from it is, it is the experience and what I did and who I was with and the time of day and the, the, the light through the trees and what it smelled like and all that uh, sensory information. Like those are the things that I remember. I even remember the people that we passed, right? Some of the people, cause they were just so vivid in my memory for various reasons. And, uh, and then from then I'll say, I, um, and this is getting into maybe a little darker area, but I, you know, I've lost both my parents over the past five um, almost five years. And when you lose people like that in your family and you have a situation where you need to pare down in terms of their belongings, right? Going through the process of having an estate sale and then having to um, pare back even further when it's time to, you know, vacate your parents' condo and, and get rid of stuff. And you're not necessarily in a position to take it all on yourself, nor do you necessarily want to, right? you have a very, um, very, very quickly, you have a, a, a understanding, you get a clear understanding as to what things matter to you, possessions matter to you, and what is really just clutter and, and stuff, I guess. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, going through that has really sharpened my, um, my ability to do that in my own life. You know, you come back and you, you look around your place and you think, Oh yeah, I have so many things that don't really matter. And if it was in, you know, knock on wood, if it was a situation where someone had to go through my place and 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 do the same thing, like what would they see as valuable? I think that's a really important practice, right? And even in yoga, if we can bring it back to yoga a little bit, I, I've always found a, a powerful meditation practice is, you know, visualizing the death of someone you love or even your own death and what that looks like and seems a little morbid, but I think what it does is it really brings us down to, to, uh, to reality. And when it comes to possessions, it's the exact same thing. Like, would, would someone that I love and care for want to keep this after I was gone even, right? Or even if I had to pare back even more into a smaller place, like what would I take with me, right? So I, I think um, 
I think the experience of losing my parents and going through that process has really helped me. And then also, um, yeah, just having these experiences like on the mountain bike to really bring forward what's important. And it's the doing. It really is. It's not what you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Similarly, my, um, my dad passed away this past year and now my mom is systematically going through the house and, oh, yeah. um, and it's, it's an ongoing process and she just is like a drawer or a cupboard or something a week. Like it's just little by little, but she's amazed, amazed at how much stuff they have. They've been in the same house for, uh, how old am I? <laughs> for a long time. Careful, careful, yeah. <laughs> right? So they've lived in the same house my entire life. And, uh, and she says they took, you know, truckloads over Christmas because they had some, some, my sister went down over Christmas and helped. And my mom I literally opened up a bedroom and went, I haven't been in this bedroom in five years. Mm. <laughs> it's like, mm. it's, it's a basement mm. bedroom and we, and it's, and it's packed to the gills and just all that stuff. And she's like, uh, she said, when I was chatting with her just this past week, she said, I would open boxes and look in them and just close them. And so just take the whole thing. I haven't looked in that box for five years. There's nothing in there that I need. Mm -hmm. um, and we really, we, we sometimes really bury ourselves in our uh, possessions. And, and sometimes we do that in the guise of retail therapy. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we have this, oh, I'll feel yes. better if I, you know, I'll boost my mood um, by going shopping because it'll give me that, that uh, uh, dopamine rush, right? All that serotonin. Yes. And it's like, oh, wow, all these feel good hormones will be pumping through my body because I found a good deal or I found just that one thing that makes me so happy. Um, so, uh, yeah, really interesting stuff. All right. So how do you, how do you see this experiencing versus owning or, or doing versus having kind of play out in society at large? And what are some of your thoughts about, you know, we've just gone through the, the Christmas acquiring season and there's still like Boxing Day sale um, <laughs> car, uh, commercials <laughs> on the TV and radio. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, people, do we really need all of this? Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I love that you brought up the retail therapy because uh, I get it, right? And that's another thing that I think I, I've, I've changed or morphed or transitioned through my life. And I still have those moments too, where especially, you know, vintage clothing shops are kind of like my thing, right? <laughs> and, it's, and you have to be really careful that you don't acquire things just because it's in the moment or it's cute on the hanger or whatever else. But, um, you know, what you're alluding to is the hedonic treadmill, right? Of this constant need to to get that hit right that 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 good feeling serotonin hit that drug right where every time you acquire something you love it and it's doing its thing for you it's serving its purpose and then it kind of loses its luster and its appeal so you need another hit right so it, you know i don't want to compare it to to drug use necessarily but it's a little it's a little bit like that right where you you keep needing this hit over and over and over again because things lose their appeal. It's just the way it is. Marketers love that <laughs> because they can always, they can always sell you something else. And, and as you said as well, right, there's always another sale, right? There's always another sale. And I, and this urgency to, you know, buy something now because it's black Friday or, um, or cyber Monday <laughs> or boxing day or boxing week. Um, when you can step back from that and realize, oh yeah, there will always be another sale and there will always be another thing, right? That you can acquire. Then it frees you up to realize that, you know, the urgency is really contrived. It's not really true. And you can, um, and then you can save your money, right? And, and sit back and, and just sort of, you know, watch the spectacle um, unfold, I guess, if you want to. But yeah, I think you brought up a couple of points, right? The retail therapy, that hedonic treadmill, and this constant, you know, I don't know, culture of sales. Um, and there will always be another one, even with airline flights, you know, you get those updates, right? You're like, oh my gosh, I have to buy my flight right now. And then you, well, no, I'll just wait a week and there'll be, <laughs> there'll be another sale. Yeah. 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 So you it's can real. take back control, right? You can take back control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you kind of step away and, and there's lots of ways to do that, but I'm, I'm lots of people I find have all these excuses for not experiencing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they mm -hmm. might say, um, 
you know, I've never done that before. Mm. So I'm going to be out of my you know, comfort zone. Um, I, 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 I'm not good at it. Uh, or I'm going to be embarrassed. Or um, I'm not the expected age, weight, gender, nationality, whatever for that activity, <laughs> right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so no, no, you know, if everyone, if everyone is different than me in the group, then I, I don't want to, I'm going to stand out like a sore thumb, therefore I pass. Uh, or I don't have enough money, or I don't have the equipment, um, all these, all these kind of excuses. And what can we say to meet those excuses, whether what have you said to yourself or what can you say to someone else to invite them into more of an experiencing life instead of an acquiring life? Mm -hmm. it, it is very similar to yoga, isn't it, right? Because I think as teachers, very quickly we hear the, we hear the story. It's almost like confessional, right? Where people come, come to you and they say, I, don't, I can't do yoga because I'm not flexible. And, uh, and you know that there's a level of fear and for all the reasons you described a moment ago, um, where they feel out of place, you know, especially men, although that's changing, but especially men, because they don't want to go to a class where it's all young women, for example, and they're, they're not, um, they're not at all the same, right? So they, they don't feel comfortable at the very least. And they have these insecurities and, and, uh, they don't want their ego to take a hit. And I always used to say, you know, if you don't know a language, um, you would go to a language class, right? If you wanted to learn French, you would go to a French class. And people understand that. And even though, sure, there's a lot of fear about going to a class like that and being vulnerable, they can, they can wrap their head around that. I'm like, oh yeah, I don't know French, so of course I'm going to go to a French class. If I'm not, if, you know, if I have poor balance or I'm not flexible, whatever the heck that means, and if I, you know, I don't have the strength, then of course I would want to go to a yoga class to build up those skills. But for some reason, the whole yoga thing, I think the way it's marketed, um, especially used to be a little bit less now, but it, it, it sort of um, prevents people from making that connection between the two. You want to get better at something, you want to learn something, then you go to X class. Um, so that was, you know, that's one thing I've told people for years, right, to try to make that association between the two. And, uh, and you're right, there's a lot of excuses. I've made them myself and, you know, all the ones that you described, time, money, money is a big one for me personally. But there's always a way around it, right? There's always a way to be creative. And if you really want to do something, then you find a way to do it. And I think it's reframing how you can do it sometimes. That's the other thing I tell people. Like, well, we can be very rigid with our thinking and say, well, if I want to be a better cyclist, then I'm going to have to cycle over the winter. And that means, you know, going to a spin class or setting up my bike on a trainer, which sucks, by the way. I don't know how people do it, but <laughs> <laughs> but when they, but when they, you know, they think about it, like, oh, well, that's, you know, I have to buy a trainer and I have to do this and I do that. I'm like, well, no, maybe you don't. Maybe you can cross train, right? And rent some skis for dirt cheap and go out cross country skiing. These are all examples from my own life, but reframing it, right? And not being so rigid with how we think it needs to go, right? And then you can free yourself up with the time and the money constraints and and all those sorts of things. So that's another thing that I found personally has helped. And what I tell other people is try to reframe your goal so that it's accessible for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing that I find that's really helpful is, you know, the people that you surround yourself with, they have such an impact on, on what your priorities are. And so if you're moving from, uh, you know, especially gifts, right? And a gift giving. I like to give gifts. I like, you know, and it's like, oh, this is what I do. I, I find the perfect thing for so-and-so and I'm always watching as I'm out and, you know, that kind of thing. And um, instead of that, think about who they are and their hobbies and how you can gift them an experience, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And and just making that more of a, a thing, you know, with, with um, my friends now and my family for their birthdays, I'm like, well, let's go out for a meal and spend the time together where, you know, it's a lunch, just the two of us or, you know, and so it's this experience of, you know, a, a lovely meal together and, and connecting instead of, oh, here's, you know, your gift bag. And I thought of you and I know you're like this thing, but um, I find that so much more often the, the experience is what I remember and those connections with other people. Mm -hmm. I, I like the idea of um, 
searching out for the perfect gift for someone. I think that's a, that's a great idea. And it, it does add a bit of a, an additional level of, of, um, I don't know, connection to the gift and attention to the gift. And I think that's really what it's meant for. Um, but the experience piece of it, I, I agree. And, and I think that also helps you then value money more in a way, and then you can spend it more wisely, right? Because if you, you know, you might say, well, spending five, $6 on a latte is silly, but if you're doing it because you're sitting down with a friend and talking with them for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, then that six dollars is gone and like done way more for you than than buying them a gift and you know sending them sending it to them would. Same thing with your dinner example, right? Where you um you spend that money wisely and and then you get this uh experience. It's it's doubly doubly valuable, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you become easier at being able to figure out how do I want to spend my time? How do I want to spend my, my money? Those are, those are huge things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And I also find that, and you can give me your thoughts about this, about the, you know, things that are bigger experiences and the planning that might go into that and the setting, you know, maybe having a special um, fund for it in your bank. It's like, okay, this is the savings fund and we're going to work toward this and maybe we're going to collect all of our empties or, you know, we're going to put all change in or wh whatever you're doing. I know a lot of people don't do change nowadays because of the electronic banking and all that kind of stuff. But however you're doing that, but that anticipation and even if it is you and a friend or you and your family or whatever, that you're working together toward a goal and however long it takes you to get there, but that anticipation makes that experience so much more valuable. And what are your thoughts about anticipation and uh, experiences? Hmm. Well, I, I'll, I'll share a story from this past year. I, uh, I checked something off of my bucket list and it had been on my bucket list for, I'm going to age myself too now, but um, probably since late teens, you know, and um, so over 20, 20 plus years and, and it was to go ski kayaking and to go ski kayaking and see orcas because why not? Right. It's, seem like chance of a lifetime thing. And a few years ago, I had discovered through Instagram, this is one, uh, one way that I find social media can be really helpful, is um, I found out about this tour company through, I believe it was Travel BC, and I sort of stalked them a little bit, and, you know, voyeurism, I was watching them, seeing what they're sort of doing, and kind of getting a feel for for um for what they did and what they offered and and then i decided okay this is going to be something that i'm going to do I'm not really sure when did a bit of research to make sure that i had a feel for and this is maybe part of the anticipation right I'm doing the mm -hmm. research about um or around what tours cost and seeing if there's a, another option that might be more affordable or anyways so that i at least could feel like if i was going to spend the money that it wasn't a rash decision now that's different for everyone some people don't care right and some people spend way too much time in that research phase too that, that prevents them from doing anything <laughs> which i can be you know I, I i can be a little bit like that but so i did the research and that was part of the anticipation and i i had a really good feel for what that sort of experience would cost me and then i was you know feeling pretty confident that this amount of money that initially seemed like astronomical um, wasn't was pretty on par with what uh, it would cost to do something like this and then um, and then I just I just went for it it was eventually like I shouldn't say just went for it, it took three two three years to actually you know pull the trigger but once I did it you know I realized after the fact too that um, I didn't feel any regrets right even though it was a lot of money uh, to throw it all at once I, I didn't feel any regrets. Whereas I could, you know, spend back to the thrift store, vintage clothing store idea, you know, I could spend $40 on something and feel really ugh, like ucky in the moment. And uh, there's the awareness piece. There's the yoga piece, I guess, that we're always trying to build, right? That mindfulness around it. Um, so you have the anticipation, you pay attention to how you're feeling, when you're feeling it, and then how you feel when you actually, you know, as I said, pull the Pull the trigger so yeah that's that's how i go about it i you know in terms of saving the money um i'm definitely someone who likes to have the money in the bank but that doesn't always happen right life happens you know car repairs happen and are you going to put your life on hold forever until you have that perfect balance in your account i don't i don't necessarily agree with that you have to be smart 
you don't want to put yourself into debt unnecessarily. But if you're spending money wisely and you have a plan to pay it back after, um, um, then why not? You know, it's sort of like having kids. Like, oh, I'll have kids when I have you know the right amount of money. Well, eventually you're going to be too old to have kids. Like just biologically, as women, we 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 have that timeline, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's the same thing. I don't necessarily feel like you have to have every sent in the bank account i think that's great if you can but sometimes that can prevent us yeah mm -hmm. it's better to have a discipline right that's also part of it is like it makes it more valuable and important when you have to have discipline to then pay down your credit card <laughs> yeah. yeah i don't know <laughs> Best six thing. dollar lattes after yeah <laughs> yeah right and and it's i like i like how you say it. it's always a balance it's a balance between you know you know, planning and doing and, you know, is it preventing you from even living? Um, and mm -hmm. like in the, in the context that we're talking about acquiring versus doing, both of those are going to cost something time and money wise. Um, mm -hmm. And where are you going to put your priorities? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lovely. I had this, uh, I had this realization this year after this trip, as a matter of fact, and I started counting how many years in my head I felt like I had you know, good living years where I felt like I'd be healthy, physically healthy to do some of these things. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have a lot fewer than I realized. Right? <laughs> and then thinking, if I only do one of those trips a year, like that's not enough. Like I have to get on this. <laughs> I have to make this more priority because time is fleeting, right? So whatever it takes to sort of, I don't know, open your eyes to, um, to how much time you have left even, right? Yeah, it's helpful. right. It's mm -hmm. like living it. Let's live in the moment and really experience this moment, whatever it is. And whether it's, you know, a small experience because there's so many small experiences. I love having a dog because I get a small experience every day when, when I go for a walk. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, or it's, your, you know, your, your skis, uh, a sea kayaking trip, which is a big experience and, and took years in the planning and the doing and the, and that type of thing. But, um, Focusing more on these experiences with other people, with yourself, with nature. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. So as we get into the new decade, the new year, um, what might be a tip for someone who's trying to switch from this having mentality to a doing mentality? What would you maybe say to somebody who's like thinking about that? It's like, ah, I don't know how I do this. Can you give us a helpful tip or two? Mm hmm. I think we alluded to one earlier. We both did, right? Where you can take stock of what you already have. Take a moment and and do that. Take an inventory and realize that you have a lot more than you realize. And then when you when you see that, literally see it in your in your home, then you feel. I I think you have a better sense of like not feeling the need to have more necessarily. Um, and then also too, to make a list of things that you want and, and then try to rank them even, right. Mm -hmm. Even if that's just in your head. Um, and, and also delayed gratification is, is a hugely helpful thing, right. That you don't need everything right away. Um, you know, for example, I, I had to get a new car. I alluded to car repairs earlier. I had to get a new car this past year. And um, that was also a process, right? And I, I thought, okay, well, now that I have this new car, I'm going to get a hitch. You know, I'm going to get a bike rack. I'm going to do these things I didn't have before in my old car. And I realized, well, you know, I'm getting my car in October. Why would I put a hitch and buy a bike rack now when I'm not really going to need that until, you know, the next. So timing is important, you know? So all these little things about, taking stock of what you already have, take the inventory, make a list of things that you want and prioritize them and put them in this sort of timeline of, you know, you don't need it all now. Right. You, um, and then when you give yourself that, that space and the whole um, delayed gratification principle, when you give yourself that space in terms of time, you can then figure out, Oh yeah, maybe I didn't want that thing as much as I, I thought I did, right? Or maybe maybe it's a yeah, it's not really a absolutely have to have. It's just a sort of maybe like to kind of have. Um, then that that frees you up. Mm -hmm. And then creativity, right? Getting creative with things that you want uh, in a way that um, reuses things that already exist too. I'm a fan of Kijiji, selling, buying, you know, renting. Um, trading whatever it is right and then at least that takes some of the scuzziness off of the 
consumerism part of it, you know. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. are some of my tips. Thank you so much. It has been a delight to connect with you and see your lovely face. And yes, chat. you too. <laughs> and Finally. Thanks to, thanks to all of our listeners. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Kim McNeil, definitely go check her out. She is on Facebook, on Instagram, and on the web. Kim McNeil Yoga, yes? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes. Um, and read some of her, her musings in her blog. She's a, a very knowledgeable lady. So thank you, Kim, for joining us today. I wish you all the best in the new year. Mm -hmm. Same to you, Donna. Happy New Year. And thank you to our listeners. Um, definitely share this podcast. We so appreciate you guys. Um, thank you for being a listener and for being here today. Namaste. Namaste.